think I'll begin. Hello everybody, good evening on this wonderful Tuesday evening and thank you for being here tonight. I'm a little nervous so I thought I'd just hang you up front. Um, I've got quite a few things to share with you. My life has many aspects to it. I don't think I've got enough time this evening to share all of it with you. And um, I probably would want to just share what I can fit in 45 minutes um, that has shaped me into the person that I am today. Um, the three pillars from my journey that have shaped me into the woman that I am today, the businesswoman and the mother that I am today, um, obviously is first of all my early life and growing up in a Turkish uh, family with, um, you know, being a migrant in this country. And then I'd like to share with you um, my 16 years of being lost and looking to find my way home and also my business um, downfall and successes actually. So my name is Ebru Sack and I'm so honoured to be here this evening talking with you. I was pleasantly surprised when I was asked to share my journey this evening. Um, I'm always ready to share my journey in all honesty. Um, and um, let me start by saying that I'm of Turkish background, as you all know. Um, and my I was only one when my parents migrated to this country from Turkey. Back in the 60s, there was an influx of um, Turkish migrants coming to this country. Um, in the 60s, there, were, there was a lot of people in Turkey uh, looking for... Um, you know, a better life um, outside of their own country in Turkey, away from the political unrest and poverty. And my dad was no different to the masses. So after a quick stint in Germany for 12 months, um, he came back to Turkey and um, began working at the Australian consulate in Ankara. And um, it's not like he's a highly educated person. What, what his role at the consulate was actually to stand in front of the door and give out um, application forms to people who wanted to migrate. Um, and one day he thought, you know, maybe I should fill out one of these forms and hand it in. Um, there, there was something that held him back though, um, even though he, he did in the end. It was that um, my mother is illiterate, so she couldn't read and write. And one of the criterias um, for coming to this country in the interview was to be able to read a passage through a book or something. Um, so my dad um, tried very hard to teach my mother how to read and write in a crash course, which obviously didn't go down too well. But my mother still today says, there was the hand of God in that interview when um, the, the guy who was interviewing them was distracted at a point and she wasn't even asked to read a paragraph from this book. And so a long story short, a suitcase and 20 bucks and my older brother and me and mum and dad, we came to Australia. And um, to the um, army barracks in Brody, there was a whole herd of Turks just being shifted over there and they, you know, the journey started. My dad had a five-year plan when he came here. And the plan was to make a bit of money, go back to their hometown where they can raise the children there um, and buy themselves a home. Um, that, that actually did happen five years after coming um, to Australia and working in factories where my dad worked the night shift in General Motors Holden and then later on at the Ford factory and my mum would work the day shift in, you know, the licorice factory. She worked at containers and she worked at Chef in Brunswick. Um, they just worked and worked and worked. And... Um, so five years later, they made some money and went back to Turkey. 
obviously they bought some, you know, bought a home, but there was no money left to live on. So they said, let's go back to Australia and do a few more years and um, then we'll be right, you know. Um, and so they came back to Australia. And, you know, once you've lived in this country, you just cannot live anywhere else. But uh, the religion and the culture was a strong part of um, my childhood growing up. Um, and my parents were eager to take us back and raise us in Turkey so that we um, wouldn't be off with um, foreigners in this country. But things never panned out the way Dad had set out. In our home, it was quite dark growing up. Uh, my dad was the dictator and my mum was always made to feel that she was the lucky one to even um, be married to my dad. Um, there was domestic violence and a lot of darkness growing up. Um, my older brother and I, we were the ones that um, really saw a lot of that. Excuse me, I'm a bit emotional. Um, so... Um, <coughs> Growing up, I, I grew up in Brunswick in Mitchell Street and I went to Moreland Primary School. And um, when uh, we were living in Mitchell Street, we lived in a little bungalow and in the back of a house, uh, there were three bungalows. In one of them we lived and in another, another family lived. And the little girl who was my age of that family became my friend. Uh, they were also Turkish migrants. Um, so we'd go to school together, come back together, and I probably would have been seven or eight years old. I don't have a lot of recollection of those years. I probably uh, consciously blocked it out. Um, and I remember one day um, coming home from school and there, there was this kerfuffle, a lot of people around, and, um, and then my friend just disappeared. My little friend um, disappeared. And later on, I found out that her father had shot her mother um, and she was left without a mother and without a father because he went to prison. And, you know, it wasn't until I grew up that I actually felt the, the significance of this and what impact it had on me, but also what impact it would have had on other people around. So, you know, nobody then you would get involved in other people's uh, family matters. So if we heard the next door neighbour screaming and shouting, we weren't to say anything, we weren't to get involved. Um, you know, they just turn a blind eye. I, I, I know, like I used to hear these sayings growing up, you know, as long as the snake doesn't bite me, it doesn't matter, let it go. Or you should never get involved in between husbands and wives fights and things like that. And and I remember when my dad would beat my mum, the next day no one would say anything to my dad. Like nobody would pull him up and say, hey mate, you can't do this. You know, neither her brother, neither his brother, neither the neighbours, you know, I, I, I couldn't understand, like, why, you don't understand, you just keep going, actually, you know. But now I look back and I think, oh, my God, like, it would have taken one person to pull that man up and say, you know what, you can't do this. You just can't do this. But that's just the way it was back then. And, you know, I'd, I'd say to my mum, let's just go, let's, let's go somewhere, you know, let's get out of here. You know, you can't, you can't keep crying like this. And she'd say, where am I going to go? I can't speak the language. I don't have money, you know. And unfortunately, back then, there wasn't a lot of help or maybe we didn't know about it. I'm not sure. Um, and I'm really glad that today there is uh, places that women can go and escape. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. It still happens today, you know, unfortunately. I was an observer growing up. I would often um, just watch and listen, and I was a bit of a loner, actually. 
growing up, we used to watch a lot of Turkish movies, all about honor, actually, all about, you know, um, the girl who has um, lost her virginity and she's damaged goods now, she's no good, therefore someone's got to either kill her or um, things like that when we were growing up. Um, so after primary school and after when I went to high school, I was taken out of high school at 14 years of age because all I needed to do was read and write. <laughs> and um, so I didn't need to, um, excuse me, <laughs> I didn't need to go on with higher education. But my dreams of becoming a doctor um, just became a dream. And at the age of 14, my dad packed up the family and took us back overseas once again. And that was, I think, the third or fourth time. Uh, by that stage, my older brother had turned 18 and he was dating an Italian girl, uh, got his car, got his license. And the thought of my brother I think ever having half Italian and half Turkish children set my dad on a frenzy and he just sold up everything and just took us back overseas. Um, put my brother in the national service and that was a 20 month gig for him, which was not very nice. I don't think he ever got over that. And um, so in Turkey, here I was not really knowing what to do I fell into hairdressing and how I fell into hairdressing my uncle has a hair salon in Istanbul who I so admire and just sweeping the floors in that salon would just energize me and I think you know what I just love this energy love this space how women would come in and tell their stories and tell their problems to my uncle and he'd call out to the apprentices go get a coffee for this young lady and the hot baguettes and the Turkish coffees and and they'd get their hair done and their nails done and they'd feel good and give tips to everybody and go and I just loved that space and that's how I fell into hairdressing and I thought one day this is exactly what I want to create a place where women can come and just be themselves in a safe place. And if I could help them feel good about themselves, that's exactly what was going to empower me. So if I could help someone feel good, that was gonna make me feel good. And so when my brother came out of the army in Turkey, he got married and then I got married. It was an arranged marriage. I was 16, barely 17. Um, I was young, I was naive, I didn't know really what it was like to be a married woman. I've got a photo though, <laughs> I'd love to show a photo of, oh I thought I had it here but <laughs> I'd love to show a photo of me, excuse me one moment. <laughs> I have a photo which I dug up just to show everyone how young I was when I was getting married the first time. That's me in my little dress. And um, the one beautiful thing that came out of that marriage is my daughter, Scylla, who I'm so proud of. And she became my inspiration to break free of domestic violence. My first marriage was um, not very pleasant. Um, it was very dark actually. And um, after I got married in Turkey and came back to this country, I didn't want to remain married, but um, I was forced to stay in that marriage. One day, um, I told my dad that I didn't want to be married any longer and this was before I had my child and he slapped me across the face and he said well you know what your death will come out of this marriage your if you want to get out of this marriage your death will come out of this marriage 
because he was not going to have his name tarnished by having a daughter that was divorced. So I stayed and I had my daughter, but something inside me was just wild and exploding that I needed to change that pattern. And my daughter was the inspiration for that. It was a very rocky road and um, I was constantly looking over my shoulder. Um, I got caught a few times um, in public by my ex-husband and he would beat me up and police would be called and, and police would say, well, press charges. And I'd say, no, I, I can't press charges because I know when the police is not there, he's going to come after me. And he actually just got sick and tired of stalking me and um, that's how that all ended and I changed addresses several times. But with that, I, did, I was disowned by the family and by everyone around me actually. It was really sad, um, unfortunately. But I had to rebuild my life and um, so I set, set out on a journey to rediscover who I was and I came across this self-development course. I was one of the very few Turkish people that um, en entered this self-development course uh, back in 1989. Um, the facilitator was Kerry Riley and um, there the, the seed of self-development and positivity was planted in my brain and I never let go since. So from reading so many books to attending seminars and courses. I just wanted to learn how to have a better life, how to find freedom and peace. It was a very long and rocky journey. Um, and um, one that I had to strive to achieve. Um, after that, I went on to opening up a salon in Kedor and things started to look up for me. Um, I opened my salon and uh, focusing on my clients, but there was always this part of me that just kept pulling me back. You know, um, it's, I, I, I just couldn't understand like, I was taking two steps forward and one step back and I'd go and meditate for 10 days and I'd go to, um, I'd go and pray in churches and I'd go to temples and um, just looking for that peace, that freedom. But I was looking externally when it was actually on the inside that I needed to find that. And um, I found peace with myself, finally. And um, in 1996, um, after opening up my salon, I, um, I was doing um, lots of photo shoots um, as far as hair and makeup on location goes. And during that time, um, I needed a lipstick and lip liners color matched and I couldn't find it. So. Um, I started drawing on what I wanted to create and so I put a lipstick and a lip liner together and put an elastic band around it and my clients would say, oh my god, Ibru, you're so intelligent. I didn't think it was intelligence, I thought it was just common sense. So I set myself on a journey to create this uh, world first product and um, so that, was, that took me three and a half years of research and development and I did launch it and it went Australia wide. Um, and um, I ended up selling the brand actually. Um, so after my first divorce, it was 16 years of just, um, you know, a little bit of business, a little bit of um, meditation, a little bit of product development and um, I got married for the second time in 2002. Um, by then, Scylla had grown up a little bit. She was 16. Um, 
and um, so I remarried um, and that marriage of mine lasted seven years. I had two beautiful children uh, from that marriage who are now in high school. Um, and the biggest turning point in my life, I think, when I thought I had it all together was um, the ending of my second marriage. Um, that was quite uh, traumatic for me. And that was 11 years ago when, again, once again, I found myself um, having to rebuild my life again. Um, and, you know, when you're not in your 20s and 30s any longer and you're a bit more mature, it, it's, it's a lot difficult, it's a lot harder um, to move forward. Um, but I did um, and it took... It took all the strength that I had um, to come through on that. Um, and today I run my own business. I have my own hair salon. Um, I have a wonderful business. Um, and, you know, my clients are priority. I um, talk to them. I um, find out what it is they need. I get involved in product development once again. I have uh, my own branded products um, in the salon. Um, I'm a little bit lost at the moment, <laughs> sorry. Um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Um, So today what's important for me is um, helping women who are in darkness to encourage them and inspire them that yesterday doesn't have to continue being the way it is. You can make choices for tomorrow, make a new tomorrow for yourself. Um, I know it's hard at times when you don't have the support But when you find that freedom internally, that gives you the strength to carry on. And for me, what's most important is to find that balance inside, that freedom inside, that peace inside. Thank you for your comments. I really appreciate it. <laughs> It, you know, I'm not, a nat I'm not a natural public speaker and when I'm in the salon, I find it really natural to speak or one-on-one, -on -one. but when I'm told that there's a camera in front of me, I get a little bit nervous. Before coming on camera, in my mind, I practiced this so many times and there were so many things that I wanted to um, share with you, but for some reason when, you know, you're on screen, it's very, very different. Um, but I guess if there's one thing that, you know, I can honestly uh, share from the heart and encourage you to do is to, you know, work on your self-esteem because when you've got a splintered self-esteem, it, it, it doesn't matter what you do on the outside, it keeps coming back and haunting you. Um, you know, whether it's an arranged marriage or family violence or just plain ignorance, building resilience to face our challenges um, and taking action can be daunting. Um, more often than not, you know, in the dark dungeons of our mind, we hold captive the people that have hurt us not realising that every captive needs a guardian. And we guard them with anger and resentment, depleting our own energy, thinking that we're punishing them for hurting us. But that's not true, you know. But when we unshackle that captive and set them free from our dungeon, that is freedom for, own, for our own mind and body and our own soul. So no matter what the colours of yesterday are, you can find the strength. And instead of holding, you know, the resentment and anger, you can choose new shades in your palette. 
and you can create a rainbow for your tomorrow. I know I did. Um, so how do we do this? You know, is the question that I get asked often. And for me, it's been meditation. For me, it's been um, continuously telling myself that I am worthy and to love myself and you know just to let let it go and you know when you walk backwards in life when you keep looking back you end up tripping over so i choose not to look back if i do look back it's to learn from it and it takes practice you know it's that it's automatic it's automatic negative thoughts that are persistent in our brain but we, if we're just present in whatever we choose to do whether it be you know when we're working when we're with our children present in when we're washing dishes whatever it is that we're doing to remain present um, be open to inspiration um, dream i say dream to my children you know dream because you only you can make it come to life and yes you are more than you think you are a gift to to yourself and to everyone else. We were put on this earth. We've all been ordained to do something. And I think I've been ordained to cut hair <laughs> and make a difference in others' lives as well. If there are any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Um, I'm just feeling a little bit nervous. Thank you, Barbara. I really appreciate your support. Where did I find my strength? One of the question is, where did I find my strength to start over um, after my second marriage? Well, I had to start all over again and I had a two-year-old and a four-year-old and I had, I, I, I was just an absolute mess, but I knew, I knew that my children deserved a better life. It was the soup. I was making soup one day and I didn't realize that I was crying into that soup that I was going to feed to my children. And I thought, oh my God, I am feeding my children my sorrow who had nothing to do with the breakdown of my marriage. And I thought, you know what, I need to wake up here. That was my turning point, actually. Um, I have a question Someone said, do I still have a relationship with my father? Um, after being disowned, I didn't speak to my dad for a number of years. And um, so many things happened in our family um, during those years. But yes, I did end up um, uh, finding peace with my dad before he passed away 10 years ago to motor neuron disease. And uh, my mother is um, alive and well, um, thank God. And my two brothers are well as well. My older brother actually has had a sad life. Um, he's very special to me. He is and always will be my hero. But he chose to numb his pain with methamphetamines, unfortunately. And... Um, but I still love him and I always will. Um, I have another question that says, um, did you give up your own dreams in that marriage? Absolutely. I did in both my marriages. My first marriage was all about survival, actually. I didn't know when, you know, uh, there was going to be... Um, violence or uh, verbal abuse or just bullying um, and um, you know I just kept quiet and for a long time I found it very hard to speak up um, you know uh, it's it's very hard when you're conditioned a certain way and um, I remember once um, reading a book by a self-development guru, Zig Ziglar, and he says, you know, mosquitoes are naturally born to fly. That's their natural instinct. They just fly. 
but you can actually condition a mosquito to not fly. So if you put mosquitoes in a jar and close the lid, they will keep jumping up trying to get out. That's naturally what they do. And for quite some time, if they keep jumping up and hitting the lid and not being able to get out, after some time when you open the lid, they actually won't fly out because they are conditioned to only jump a certain height. And that's how I felt in growing up, actually. Um, first in my own family, it was, we were conditioned. You just didn't speak up. Um, and my mother too, she'd just tell us to be quiet, you know. Um, yeah, that black leather belt with that brass buckle, that would keep us quiet. Um, yeah. But um, today I have a voice. Um, my children say it's overly loud. And I say, well, maybe I should take up singing. <laughs> but um, I do have a voice and I won't be quiet if there's anything that is not right that upsets me or anybody, actually. I will call it out if I see a woman who's not treating, um, who's not being treated right, I will call it out. Um, thank you. Thank you for the messages. Yeah. What advice can I give? Um, some of the things that I've gone through in marriages, Turkish community in Australia, Turkey or elsewhere has changed and will now speak against domestic violence. Aysen, thank you so much for that question. Um, you know, recently there has been on social media, the black and white photos that people put up. Well, you know, and then they tag someone to uh, put it up as well. And, you know, a, a lot of people don't know actually the, the meaning behind that. But the black and white photo challenge started as a way for women to raise their voice, to stand in solidarity with women, with the women we have lost, to show that one day it could be their picture that is plastered across news outlets with a black and white filter top. Turkish people wake up every day to see a black and white photo of a woman who has been murdered on their Instagram feed, on their newspapers, on their TV screens. And as if this is not enough, our government, the Turkish government, is trying to abolish certain aspects of the Istanbul Convention, which is a human rights treaty that protects women against domestic violence. So not only are they not trying to stop it, they're literally trying to make it legal for them to not stop it. The Turkish government and the justice system does nothing to stop these crimes. Most often the murderers barely get a slap on the wrist or no charges at all. This is very real in Turkey. Um, I know that, you know, the, you know, we there's a lot of groups here now trying to make a difference, but just I think it was a couple of weeks ago where three women were murdered again in in like a space of two weeks time um you know people women take out uh, intervention orders but nothing gets done i mean what does an intervention order do anyway because when a man wants to come and kill that woman they do and you know when when i was beat up in the middle of ligon street and dragged on the concrete floor and somehow got loose and ran from there and the police came and picked up my ex-husband. They took him in and they said, I think you need to charge him so he can be accountable for what he has done. And I refused to press charges absolutely refused. As they were taking him away, he was yelling at me saying, I'm going to kill you. And I knew that he was capable of doing that. By pressing charges, he it would have just infuriated him even more. So I didn't press charges. But today there are people that take out intervention orders and sometimes it works, which is fantastic. But a lot of the times it doesn't work. 
what do we do about this? How do we stop it? I think if we were to educate women, because women are mainly the ones that raise the sons, the boys, I think we can slowly start to change. We need to change from the root. We need to help these women in darkness so that they can go on to raise gentlemen who will go on to raise gentlemen. I'm not sure how else, um, you know, but we've got to have a voice and stand tall and not back down from this constantly. Uh, thank you for your messages. Um, I'm happy to answer any messages. Um, also, Friendship is very important for me because I lost a friend when I was very, very young. I lost a friend to domestic violence. No, she didn't die, but her mother did. And I have never, ever been able to find that friend of mine ever again. She was just taken, just like that, out of the blue. She was just taken and I never, ever saw her again. And that's why today... I make it known to my friends that I care for them. And we all need to do that. We all need to be there for our friends because some women just suffer in darkness, suffer in silence because they don't want to be known as they're married to a horrible person or they're in a relationship with a horrible person or they're too embarrassed about it, they're too ashamed. And I, and I lived in shame as damaged goods for years myself and I know what that feels like. But you don't have to be like that. It doesn't have to be like that. You need to speak up and you need to ask for help. I lost another friend, actually, as a teenager, but she didn't die. She was forced to marry a man who was as old as her father. She didn't want to. She loved somebody else. But they beat her until she said yes. And she did. To me... I don't think she lived after that. She just existed and she still does, just exists. We are not put on this earth to just exist. We are made of a bundle of energy and love. And we can support each other. We can love one another. We don't have to resort to violence. You know, and I think when women have a voice and step up and stand up and say, you know what? You can't treat me like that anymore. You can't do that anymore. They need to be the role models for the next generation, for their sons and their daughters. I don't have any sons, so I don't know what it's like to raise a son, but I have daughters and I hope that I can inspire them to speak up, to, to not only... Um, speak up for when they're being mistreated but never to mistreat anyone either it doesn't mean that you know women don't mistreat men that does happen as well but it goes both ways so it's not that i want my you know girls to grow up and go and abuse their partners or their husbands no it's about living in harmony isn't that what what we are designed to do live in harmony I believe it is. And um, so if there are any more questions, um, I'm happy to answer. I'm still a little bit nervous, but I feel a little bit better. <laughs> um, so today I live an extraordinary life. Even though it wasn't extraordinary for a long time, it was very ordinary. But I tell you something, once you live an extraordinary life, ordinary is not an option. And how I live an extraordinary life, I am committed to my children, to my business, I live with integrity, I am self-sufficient, I work hard, um, I have a goal, I dream big, and you know, I, I work hard, 
and um, I hope that I make a difference to the people that come into my life. Um, and as a legacy, I'm creating a brand um, which is all about actually women and inspiring women. My brand, Sacred Ground, which will launch in 2021, this is not about advertising, just telling you that um, Sacred Ground is a platform where I will use my skills uh, in product development and branding and um, to you know create beautiful products but the intent behind the brand is to inspire women to live a fulfilling life and hopefully with um, you know the uh, funding through sacred ground we can help women in um, achieving their goals so that's something for the future definitely working on that at the moment um, and um, hopefully um, next year I'll also begin consulting in small business um, and helping women going into business um, to not make uh, the mistakes that I've made in business and to stop spending money unnecessarily um, and you know set goals and achieve them um, and help them with product development if they wish. Thank you. Thank you for your messages. That's beautiful. How do I rise above my negative experiences and become an incredible entrepreneur, business owner, and public speaker? Uh, that's a beautiful compliment. Um, you know, when during the time that I was looking for peace, and looking for freedom and looking for happiness. I thought it was out there. And I'd look for it in the wrong arms, the wrong eyes, the wrong bodies. But it's actually inside us to find that balance. Everybody, everybody has a a place in their heart that they can go to to find that peace. Sometimes it's untapped, that's why we don't know where it is. But believe me, it's there. And it's all about turning in. One of my favorite authors puts it so well. He says, if you don't go within, you will go without. And that is so true. So look inside, I say and just sit with yourself for a while have a relationship with yourself the best thing i ever did was to have a relationship with myself have communication with myself because when you know your worth you won't allow anybody to mistreat you and the day i made that commitment to myself is when my life started to change on the outside but it began on the inside I hope I've uh, answered that question for you. Thank you for all your kind messages. If there's anybody that wants to ask another question, I'm happy to take your questions. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I'm happy to share my experiences as well. Um, my kids are really thriving actually. Uh, the kids are in high school and um, they're thriving. Um, my firstborn, the apple of my eye, has um, turned out to be an amazing young woman um, who has a degree in creative writing and communications. Um, Scylla has jet set it around the world. Um, and lived and worked overseas for five years. I mean, what an inspiration she is. She was my inspiration to live a better life, to break free from, you know, the patterns of domestic violence. And I'm so proud to say that she is thriving herself. Um, and she's back in Melbourne to make Melbourne her home. Um, so I'm looking forward to the other two, uh, hopefully to follow in her footsteps so they're still in high school at the moment. 
Um, and I'm celebrating 10 years with Sax Salons, I'm proud to say. Uh, it wasn't easy, it was a rocky road um, and there's been a lot of mistakes along the way um, with branding, with, you know, uh, business decisions gone wrong. But, you know, they, they, they're actually never wrong decisions. They, they teach us, they teach me. Um, and unfortunately, you know, some of our mistakes are costly and it has, uh, some of my mistakes has cost me dearly. But, you know, I, I wouldn't have it any other way. I am who I am, not in spite of my journey, but because of my journey, because of every single person that has come into my life whether they had been hurtful or whether they had been uplifting. But all of that has um, contributed to the person that I am today. Thank you for your messages. If there's anybody else that would like to um, ask, and thank you for listening too, I really want to say a huge thank you to everyone taking the time out on this um, Tuesday evening during dinner time um, and listening to me speak. Um, my apologies if I've been a little bit um, at times uh, my nerves get the better of me. I'll, I'm working on it. <laughs> mm. Thank you so much. So I'm going to close it now um, and um, I hope you've enjoyed my story, my journey. Um, I'll be working on the nerves definitely. Thank you.